Kwe, Alana DeLuisi, Nina Elnu. Hi everyone, my name is Alana Walalieg. Thank you for joining us. Working here at Surrey Art Gallery as an engagement facilitator and arts educator with our school programs, it has been my privilege to share with students, teachers, gallery visitors, and now you, artworks from a permanent collection, a growing collection of art kept in trust for the people of Surrey, and the stories that these artworks carry. I'd like to introduce Reese Edwards, who will share more about today's event and about the exhibition, Where We Have Been. As I think about where I have been, I also think about where I am. I am working on and benefiting from unceded Coast Salish territory, including that of the Kwantlen, Keitsi, and Semiama nations. It is my responsibility to the people of this territory, to the stewards of this land, to continue to work on, act on, and understand what it means to be here. Walaliok, thank you. My name is Rhys Edwards and I am assistant curator here at Surrey Art Gallery where I support exhibitions, publications and the gallery's permanent collection. I am privileged to work on the unceded territories of the Keitsi, Kwantlen and Semiama nations. This year the gallery is celebrating its 45th anniversary with an exhibition of artworks from our permanent collection called Where We Have Been. This exhibition brings together some of the gallery's oldest acquisitions into conversation with some of its newest to examine ideas of place, memory, and history in the south of the Fraser region. Many of the artworks on display depict moments from Surrey's history and show us how the world has changed over the years. Or they picture the places and environments within which we find ourselves, in the city or the suburbs, in the countryside, the forest, the beach, or the river. Others speak to the inner experiences of artists and community members. All of these are expressions of how we have lived and where we have been. As much as this is a show about the past, it is also a show about the present, about how art both shapes and reflects the community and life that we have. It is a show about the challenges of finding a home in a globalized world, riven by political turmoil, ecological catastrophe, and virological anxiety, and about how art can speak to these issues. This afternoon, I am joined by four artists who have work on display in Where We Have Been for a discussion about how art can respond to the present moment. Sunia Su is an interdisciplinary artist whose practice is informed by both Kokwakawak and Western approaches to art making. His work is often autobiographical, and explores his family's history as a way to shed light on Canada's treatment of the Indigenous peoples. His work in the exhibition, Welcoming Those They Did Not Want, combines Indian design motifs with Kokwakawak formline as an act of solidarity, bringing awareness to the South Asian migrants who were denied entry to Canada in 1914. Heidi McKenzie is a ceramic sculptor, arts journalist, and curator who is dedicated to the craft of reinvigorating modernism in our times. Inspired by her mixed Indo-Trinidadian and Irish-American ethnicity, her work addresses issues of race, identity, and belonging. Heidi learned the Japanese coil building technique to create spring, paisley uprooted, in Australia. The work is a hybrid of multiple influences, including Western modernism, Indian design, and its globalization through the UK textile industry. Helma Sawatsky is an interdisciplinary academic and artist who recently received her PhD from Simon Fraser University's School of Communication. Her research focuses on photography, embodiment, and mediation, and her data-based artworks explore the nature of digital imagery in contemporary culture. Neither photograph nor painting, scatter plots, Bear Creek Park, is a playful meditation on the construction of digital images. 
Jan Wade juxtaposes pop culture, new world imagery, and found materials and objects in her mixed media sculptures and assemblages. As an artist, she researches for socio-political symbols and practices of diasporic and African slave cultures. In Memory Jug, Wade honors the memories of black men killed by police violence in recent years, while also evoking black experience, culture, and memory through the assemblage of mementos. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our live stream event. I believe we are now live. Uh, thank you all of you who are joining us from home, whether that's on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, I am delighted to be hosting this afternoon's event, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Sonia Su, uh, Heidi McKenzie, Helma Swatsky, and Jan Wade this afternoon. Uh, before we get going, just a couple of things. I um, want to let you everyone know who's watching us that we do have a couple of moderators in our chats on Facebook and YouTube, uh, Savi and Alana. Thank you to Savi and Alana. Uh, they will be fielding any questions and comments that you would like to send in over the course of the next hour. So please uh, do feel free to contribute to the conversation. Uh, we should have a little bit of time at the end of a discussion to, to take a look at some of those. Uh, they're also going to be sharing some little snippets and bits and pieces about each of the artists and their works in the chats as we move forward. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to get started. Uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the individual artworks in the show before we open up to a group discussion. Uh, to begin with, uh, I think one of the major themes of the show, of where we have been, is place and land. And I, I think this is a theme that we see uh, in, in all of your works. But uh, first of all, I'd like to talk to Sunny Asu a little bit about this theme. Hi, Sunny. Hello. Hello, hey, thank you for joining us. Yeah, um, well. I just wanna mention that, that your piece, uh, Welcoming Those Who Did Not Want, was commissioned by the South Asian Canadian Histories Association for the uh, Trauma, Memory and the Story of Canada project. And that the piece was shown at the All India restaurant uh, in Vancouver's Little India. Um, now, one particular aspect of this work, uh, which I think of as kind of like a little Easter egg, and uh, for those of you uh, who may not know, an Easter egg is like a kind of little, maybe a little secret, or maybe not so much a secret, um, but something that I think is is quite interesting is is on the uh, the hat of the uh, the welcome figure that we see in this work, you can see a a, a kind of Google map marker, right? Um, now, I know you've been working with maps. Recently, you have uh, uh, your Landlines series, I think you've been working on over the past year. And I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about, about what maps mean to you uh, in your practice right now. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I've been working with maps uh, probably for the last three years within my work. And uh, at first started off with uh, looking at um, a collection of um, marine charts I inherited from my grandfather after he passed away. And uh, he passed away in the mid 90s or early 90s sorry and uh, i just been kind of packing around this these chart books for decades from wherever i went wherever i went um and i always wanted to do something with them um but my mother forbade me from painting on them or cutting them up <laughs> or destroying them because they're, oh, yeah. they're personal to us um so what i did is i scanned them in and I scanned them into my computer, but since they were larger than a scanner bed, I had to uh, break them into chunks. Uh, but in scanning those in and in chunks, I was able to blow the images up rather large uh, and zoom in quite a bit um, onto these marine charts um, on my computer. 
and I've even been able to print them off uh, wall size, like 17 by 14 for double spread and, and whatnot. Um, but what I was uh, really interested in was looking at how uh, um, land was divided and taken over by uh, settlers and colonists uh, throughout Canada's history. Um, and uh, what the government left behind for us as indigenous peoples. Uh, and then blowing up these, these marine charts to larger than their, their average scale, I was able to see um, where uh, the government broke off these chunks of land and gave them to us as what we could have out of our territories. Mm -hmm. They're known as reserves. Um, and I use that kind of fracturing within the works, uh, within the coppers and breaking them out. And depending on the, the page you're looking at of them, that specific, from that specific series you're looking at, you can see specific pieces broken out of the coppers and such. Um, after the fact, I, I found this quote um, here at the Campbell River um, Museum um, on a old photograph from a surveyor's uh, surveyor's photograph and it was a picture of some uh, Hupsquith men, uh, so down island uh, in the town of peoples, um, looking through surveyor's tools and the quote that was written across the bottom of this particular photograph was they make lines on the land that only they could see. Yes. Um, and I found that was really powerful in seeing someone as it's not my specific ancestor, but an ancestor so seeing that and going, you know, you are making these lines of land, but only you see them. What, why, how, what happens to us kind of thing. And maps to me became a fascination just because of how those colonial boundaries have been set up and what has been left over for us. Mm -hmm. I see. And so with the, with the welcome figure and in welcoming those they do not want, is the use of that, that kind of Google map marker, is that a way of sort of countervailing that effort of saying, you know, this figure is, is himself marking land or is marking a, a, a site of interest or, or, or creating a, an official title to that perhaps? Uh, yeah, I'm not really too sure. I just, I just found it was really a, a pleasant image to, to use, uh, to come up with. I actually came up with that design uh, for, a, for another work that um, uh, Brendan Tang and I worked on for uh, my exhibit at uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery called We Come to Witness and Dialogue with Emily Carr. And uh, we were looking at her ceramics specifically. Um, and I just wanted to use that kind of iconic image of the Google place marker um, within that ceramic piece um, to kind of place our presence on the land. And I guess in a way through uh, welcoming those they did not want, um, that does became a way to uh, place the indigenous presence onto the land and rooted into the land, much like with the welcome figure itself, it's rooting um, the indigenous conversation within the image and within that dialogue. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about this figure. Um, you've mentioned, I think, in your statement that uh, the figure and, and the box in particular that the figure is standing over is a, is a, a retainer or a hold of history. Mm -hmm. And that the figure is employing the view, I think, to come and engage with that history. So there's a, there's a sense in which the box is a, is a repository for, for knowledge and also for difficult truths. When I look at this figure, I, I think he has this, uh, the figure is welcoming, but there's also this expression maybe of, um, or judgment or, or maybe suspicion, perhaps. And I'm, I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the ambiguity in this work or uh, the, if, there's, if, you, if you consider it to be an ambiguity between what is expressed and, and, and what is hidden. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, with the, the look on the figure's face, um, I, I didn't want to portray it as, as something that was, yeah, you know, because I guess really what I wanted to talk about in this piece is that I wanted to kind of theorize that if this ship had landed, um, in what we know now as Canada on the west coast. Of you're, you're talking Columbia. about uh, Kamagata Maru here. Yeah, exactly. Um, that if there was no colonization that happened here in Canada, that with just the indigenous presence being unaffected by that colonization, I believe that the indigenous peoples would have welcomed um, those uh, those people who were fleeing from whatever political turmoil they were fleeing from um, with welcome arms, um, as opposed to how uh, the colonial governments um, handled the situation as they turned them around. Um, so, I, you know, I guess in a way it was kind of like, uh, 
you know, maybe a disapproving face looking towards the colonizer, uh, you know, looking at that, you know, acknowledge your own history, understand where you come from as a person who considers themselves a Canadian, um, much like how uh, the figure is standing on top of that cedar box, as I liken it. Um, and I kind, of, I kind of think about it um, with something that I learned recently about my own um, culture and heritage is that we as a family and we as a culture have um, these kind of box of treasures that holds um, like conceptually hold our names and our stories um, that we bring out during potlatches and specific ceremonies to share those. Uh, and then it goes back into the box and it is saved again for, you know, its later purposes. Um, and that's something that I, you know, I kind of look back and think about with this specific piece with that box is that there is content within this box that is hidden um, that needs to be known and needs to be a addressed and it has been addressed but i feel that a lot of the kind of um social political problems that we're having currently in this country um could really be uh not rectified but properly addressed with people understanding um the complete history of how this country came to be mm -hmm. yes uh, thank you sunny um i i think uh, you touched on a, an interesting point there about the notion of a box as a uh, uh, container of treasures uh, and I know for many Northwest Coast Indigenous cultures, uh, the cedar box is a, a, a very important item. Um, and a, a, in some cultures, it, it, it honors the past, it also honors the dead. And I think that that's an appropriate point to turn to another artist in our conversation who has also created something that in part uh, honors the dead and is in part a, a vessel for knowledge, uh, Jan Wade. Uh, you have been working on your memory jug series for uh, a couple of years now. Um, before I uh, ask you a couple of questions, I just want to mention in the intro video, uh, you know, we spoke, I, I spoke about, uh, mentioned that the jug features the names of black men who've been killed by police violence over the past few years, but the, the name of Sandra Bland is also on that jug. So I, I just want to... Yes, and children. Yes. yes. And family members, etc. Yes. There are many different names. Yes, I wanted to, to, to foreground that. Well, because, you know, all Black people are potential victims of this violence that's been going on for over 400 years since the first slave ships landed in, mm -hmm. on the North American continent. Yes. So um, I grew up in Hamilton, Ontario, and I grew up in a predominantly Black community. Um, I mean, it's hard for people to realize that that things were quite segregated um, when I was growing up. I just turned, as I said, I just turned 68. So, I mean, I was eight years old when um, little Ruby Bridges did her march guarded by the, by the National Guardsmen into an all white, you know, unsegregated school. And although I did go to a school that potentially wasn't segregated, <clears throat> I went to kindergarten and then the teachers took my mother and father aside and they said, we want to put Janet in special education class. And special education class in our school was where every other child of color was. So there were like the three native kids, the four black kids, the two Japanese kids, whoever was a child of color was in special education class. So that's mm -hmm. where they wanted to put me. So basically my mother said, well, she doesn't need a special education. She just needs an education. Mm -hmm. So I was basically the only child of color that was in the general population of the school mm -hmm. and not in this special education class, which made it very, very difficult for me for the first three years of school um, because the kids in special education, they got their own recess time. They were pretty much, they were segregated from yes. the larger school population. So, um, so John, I, I, I wanted to ask like, to, with that, you know, with, with, this, with your background and with, with this uh, uh, latent um, uh, segregation uh, happening, um, did this inform your interest in, in researching the traditions of, of African American slave cultures in the Southern United States that, that informed the, the memory jug? Um, not initially because, you know, of course, when I was about four, we, we moved to um, a whole different part of town. Things were changing. I mean, it was beginning to be the 60s and things were really, people don't really understand how quickly things changed from the 50s to the 60s. A lot, 
on the surface anyway changed. Yes. Um, so initially, I mean, I think I was in grade five and I saw a little film about the Ontario College of Art and I said, I'm going there. <laughs> and I didn't really think about what the what would block me from going there. I just put my blinkers on and that's where I headed. And luckily, when I was in high school, I was um, chosen to attend a comprehensive arts high school that had, you know, nine art teachers and was the whole top floor of the high school. And I took art half the day, every day. And that was meant to prepare me to go to OCAD. But um, by the time I got to OCAD, they just basically said, well, do what you want, because I'd already learned everything you were supposed mm -hmm. to learn in the initial first year. Yeah. So when I did get to art school, I mean, of course, I'd been taught about the history of European art and right. European artists because I was the only black child in the school and in the program. And so when I did get to OCAD, um, that was when I really started thinking, OK, well, you're going to be an artist and what are you going to talk about? And it took me a while, but I started realizing, well, I want to talk about where I come from and who right. I am. And that is when I really started to, I mean, it did take, it doesn't happen overnight, you know, as they say with artists, you zigzag around all over the place until you initially, if you're lucky, find your subject matter. So mm -hmm. that and was so that's, it. That's it kind took of, me a number of years. Mm -hmm. I probably didn't really start diving into it until I actually moved to Vancouver in the early 80s and mm -hmm. then became a part of the Vancouver art scene that was when I, it really kind of started to kick in. Mm -hmm. But those strains were always there. You, you had that those interest. Strains were in, always and, there. Mm -hmm. Because I was, I was, for the first four years of my life, spent every day with two old ladies, black ladies from the southern United States. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, so it was there, definitely. <laughs> so um, I think someone else who, who also has a... a, a a deep uh, a connection with with family, uh, and whose family interest informs her work is Heidi McKenzie. Uh, hello, Heidi. I think you are Hi. joining us uh, from Ontario today. Yes. Good afternoon. Yes. Hello. How's it going out there? Um, well, as of midnight, we're a bit locked down, but yeah. uh, otherwise, beautiful, sunny, cool fall. Okay. Well. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I, I thought it interesting. To, it's interesting to look at your work. Uh, in comparison um, with Jan's, because I think both of you are mm -hmm. uh, addressing uh, deep uh, family histories and, and, and deep um, kind of cultural connections. But there's, mm -hmm. formally speaking, I, actually, uh, for those of you looking at home, you can see uh, Heidi's work just behind me here. Um, and yours, there's, there's almost like an inversion of Jan's, whereas Jan's is it's very, there's a lot going on here. It's, very, it's a very fulsome work. Yours mm -hmm. is um, quite minimal. And there's a lot of uh, there's and there's a lot of emphasis on on negative space. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about your interest in in negative space and, and in absence? Yes, um, I'm glad you asked me that. I um, so this piece, uh, Paisley Up uh, Spring, Paisley Uprooted, um, mm -hmm. is has has two uh, spherical negative spaces, and it's part of a, a larger series, and all of the pieces in that series have spherical negative space. Um, and, uh, you know, conceptually, the thinking behind that was uh, to, to sort of highlight, as you said, absence, um, mm -hmm. but also to look at the possibilities of a portal for inviting others in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was interested in I've always been interested and attracted to uh, the great minimalist modernists, um, you know, Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth and, and uh, uh, Constantine Brancusi um, and studied their works. Um, and something happened to me while I was at OCAD when I started to, to really start thinking about public art and sort of the plethora of figurative Eurocentric public art we have in Toronto. And then the sort of smaller group of abstract art and, th and, and think about notions of how abstraction can appeal to uh, broader diverse populations. And I guess where I wanted to go with my work was to take a form that is, is uh, typically viewed as a Eurocentric uh, in its 
genesis uh, in its genre um, and exclusionary and uh, reflect an image or an iconic image that would invite part of my heritage, which is Indo-Trinidadian, into the mix. And ironically, as it happens, the other part of my heritage is Irish, my mother being of Irish uh, heritage from, from um, Canada and, and the States. Mm -hmm. So the Paisley does both brilliantly because um, I think as an audience member uh, in your gallery who walked in with a uh, white settler background, might see that, might see a paisley and might relate to the 19th century uh, textile industry that actually uh, is rooted in Paisley, Scotland um, and is now ubiquitous in the textile industry. And uh, the first, second, third and fourth generation South Asians on the West Coast who walked into your gallery. And as we know, and as, as um, Sunny alluded to, uh, the, the South Asians have been in, on the west coast of Canada since the latter part of the 19th century. If they walked into uh, the gallery, they might hopefully see uh, a reflection of themselves, that, that iconic image that um, is in Sunny's work um, to express uh, 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 the South Asian identity uh, that really comes out of the century old uh, from the Persian empire. The, the mango pit, the almond seed eye. Yes, right. It is it is this highly versatile um, motif with, with so many of these different um, mm -hmm. histories to it. I'm actually wearing little paisley today, I think if you can see. Yes. And um, I, it's also funny, I think mentioning, I, I, I did put Sunny's work quite, quite close to yours because I, I believe Sunny also in yours, there, there is some, uh, some, some Indian kind of design going on in there. And mm. I, I believe there are, uh, yes, yeah, so there are some, some paisley uh, motifs going on there as well. Um, now, uh, I, I think it, and you, you have another um, body of work where, where you've started to introduce um, figures from, uh, from your family into the work. So there has been, been this kind of uh, move mm -hmm. from absence maybe into to presence. Um, one other artist I think who is working with uh, absence uh, or in a very different way is uh, Helma Sawatsky. Uh, so Helma, in, in your body of work, your, your scatter plots series, um, we see uh, what appear to be photographic images, but then you have intervened into these images and uh, enlarged the size of some of the pixels uh, so that they are more mm -hmm. visible and in the process kind of revealing the illusion at heart of them. Uh, I think it's, um, it's appropriate that we're showing uh, that piece, I think, at this time of year, because uh, it is, a, it is a, an image of a tree in Bear Creek Park where we are situated. And the leaves, I think, are just, they're just on the, the, the ends of their uh, shift now, so to speak. But um, last week, the image that we would see in your image is very similar to what we'd see outside. And uh, I've seen lots of people, you know, posing next to these trees uh, as the leaves come down, looking for those beautiful photographs. Now, I know you've done a lot of research into photography and digital imagery. And um, I'd like to know, what is it that you think people want out of these images, these photographs, you know, what, what is the, the latent desire in there? And, and you're speaking now about the scatter plots specifically? Well, uh, or... no, I mean, I'm talking more about photographs. I mean, okay. I feel like, you know, because I think, I think you're riffing on, on, on photography as mm -hmm. a concept. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very interested in, in, uh, in mediation, which is kind of the, the, the whole process that, infuses all my research as well as my work in terms of how um, certain forms uh, give us access to certain experiences but at the same time shape them in particular ways. So um, I've, I've been very fascinated to see the place that photography has uh, has taken and has kind of has kind of mushroomed over the decades in, in our lives where it almost seems now at this point that experience is almost impossible without its visual documentation in the form of a photograph, of being in the picture of your own life. It is more and more like people, uh, um, yeah, people experience through the act of photographing and looking back at the photograph. And so it's like, it's almost, yeah, as if that makes things more concrete, even though the images are quite elusive. 
<laughs> in, in their materiality being just uh, some something that is displaying on a screen and that you can just swipe past. And within uh, within the the scatter plot series, I, I play with that a little bit in uh, with with this image as, as as a stage and with image resolution and the uh, the I it, it I guess it comes a bit from from process of spending a lot of time in front of a monitor with digital image editing, zooming in and out and and uh, in nature when we want to to get closer to the detail of things, we come closer and closer and closer and we start seeing all the detail. And with photographic images and especially here digital images, uh, that is not the case. As soon as you you zoom in, you zoom in, you zoom in, and then at some point it just kind of gets away from you because you end up in, in that abstract space of just little squares on a grid. And so, uh, whereas like if you're dealing with actual physical materials, uh, you can then discover maybe textures on that micro level of, and with digital photography that, dis that dissipates. So in that particular work, I, I play with that and mm -hmm. I take images at different resolutions and I shift them then on, on the image to mm -hmm. give the sense of leaves sweeping up in the air, but it's, it's all a matter of proximity. Mm -hmm. it, from a distance, it appears to be one thing and the brain then kind of fills in the gaps. And as soon as we come close, that, that falls apart, that illusion. And then it's like up to you almost if you, uh, if you kind of get intrigued with, with the technicalities of it, or if you prefer to kind of stay in that place of, of, of desire and, and what, what it symbolizes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think there is a kind of mourning happening in your work? And, and I ask that because um, I, I see these leaves kind of flying off wistfully from the tree, you know, it's, it, um, but it's also, I think, it seems like a mourning over the, the loss of the illusion or the, the loss of, um, of access to, to reality, perhaps, uh, this sort of move into abstraction into digital world. What, what do you think of that? It's interesting that you should bring it up because uh, a lot of the art that, uh, a lot of my work with photography is about, about loss. And at the same time, trying to find, uh, like in, in, in the kind of almost deconstruction or de decomposing of the images, which is what I do also in the later work that uh, you had in your exhibition in the fall, the data mulch pieces, which yes. are, these large complex kind of uh, fragmentation of image data that also kind of lives on that threshold of deconstruction and turning it, flipping into something else. And uh, it, it, is, it is to some extent about loss, but also about that choice that you have, have in terms of, of, of what, you, what you want to hang on to or what the medium affords you in terms of maybe a sense of hope or a sense of uh, something new emerging in, in something else coming to an end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helma. Um, I, I think that that sense of coming to end or, or maybe loss, uh, I think is actually uh, something I see in, in all of your works. Uh, you know, in, in, in different formats, you know, I, I think there um, maybe is, is an element of, um, of a recognition of the past, or but maybe also um, of, a, of a loss of something or, or a shift in a paradigm. Um, I'd like to maybe open up the floor a little bit now. Did, did anyone have any comments or questions that they would like to, to, to share about each other's work? Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess I am, in the long run, I'm more, really more familiar with Sonny's work. And I find his, uh, I just the other day um, saw his, well, they're anti-masks, I suppose. <laughs> Is that what you would call them, Sonny? The chunks of wood that you can see somehow, uh, uh, or the I, forms of a mask, but the mask the mask doesn't really exist, but the yeah, well, I, yeah, I do. Refer, I do refer to them kind of colloquially as masks, um, 
and they're they're meant to kind of reference that kind of uh, sculpture object that the mask is, mm -hmm. um, but they're just uh, rescued, reclaimed uh, chunks of cedar that were offcuts from the log home industry, um, where there was a log home development site back here on my reserve about uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, yeah, and they were just pieces of wood that were going to be tossed away because they had no intrinsic value to the developer or to the end consumer. Um, but as uh, Indigenous peoples, especially from the Northwest Coast, we do view cedar as something that's highly prized and high, highly valuable. So I just wanted to um, uh, preserve that and give them uh, a life as art as opposed, or a life as culture and art, as opposed to just, you know, offcuts and pieces of garbage. Yes, and I suppose like I can really relate to that because I use a lot of what people would call found objects, but I like to think of as reclaimed objects. I have always been interested in old things and even as a child, things with history. Mm -hmm. And literally, if I was walking down the street, I would pick up an old thing or a thing that had been discarded and put it in my pocket because for me, it had some sort of life. Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just a discarded thing. It still had some possibility of life. So I, I find that really interesting, the idea of, you know, old things or things that are discarded. And certainly we are living in a time where we realize that we cannot be just discarding materials and things because, you know, they are precious. Wood is like gold. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's no less precious than a, a semi-precious stone. It's, we can't just keep living like it's an endless um resource for us you know yeah. so um and the government yeah, feels me, it's for interesting me, to objects with history are quite incredible yeah no I, th I think there's definitely a commonality between um that you know what you're saying and and me personally i think we we probably have a lot in common that way uh, i actively collect kitchen objects of you know ephemera that could be considered um racist depictions of indigenous folk um, but even just thinking about, you know, the comments that you're saying about how we just consume, consume and consume, and we don't really have an understanding of that, of there's an, there's an end point coming sometime soon. And you would think that the government knows, or they would take steps to rectify those, those issues, especially around logging, um, with the scarcity of old age, um, forests uh, that no longer exist in BC and the government still wants to open up first growth um, forests to logging um, because of the value of the wood itself. Um, but, you know, once those forests are gone, once that carbon is released into the atmosphere, there's so much that could just go sideways um, that we necessarily don't think about. And it's almost like we've been kind of programmed to not think about it through the act of right. consuming. <laughs> Well, it's so, part of uh, miseducation of us all. Mm -hmm. really. no, for sure. You know, it's what we're all dealing with, I think, in a way in our work. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I often think about how we've grown up in this culture where we are right from the get-go miseducated. Mm -hmm. So how can mm -hmm. we un understand one another if we are just fed this propaganda and this miseducation? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to jump in here because, you know, I think this is a really vital conversation and I, I think it's been um, compounded uh, by the present moment. You know, of course, uh, deforestation, resource extraction are, have been ongoing issues for, for centuries, really. Um, but I think in this present moment, we're now in a place where uh, that extraction is now even more abstract uh, in a sense that we, we, we it's now ever more difficult to go outside, ever more difficult to, to navigate the environment. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this with all of you because I, I think all of you have different relationships to, uh, to material and to tactility, to the tactile. Uh, you know, I think in this moment, we, um, it's, it's hard to touch things, uh, but all of you have uh, special relationships with the tactile. Um, and I was wondering if, if you could speak a little bit about how your relationship to, to materials, to tactility has changed over the past few months, or if you feel it has changed. Hmm. Um, well, uh, in, in the work that I do, um, I consider myself a ceramic 
fine craft artist and, and I work in ceramics um, in a very pragmatic way uh, on March 10th. Um, I found myself uh, stockpiling, <laughs> even mm. though clay is of the earth. Uh, they are, you know, I would say 99% of practicing ceramic artists are working with manufactured clay, um, which is not, uh, which as Jan pointed out, like wood is a finite resource and there are clay pits um, that are, you know, um, vanishing in the world. And ultimately we will, mm. we will not have porcelain um, at some point we will run out of different types of clay and the, and the resources that we need to uh, manufacture um, these clay bodies. But in, in terms of how um, pandemic times uh, has affected my sensibility, I would have to say that, that it has affected my overall sensibility and not just my sensibility to the, to the tactile material, but my overall sensibility to uh, time and being. I, I would definitely have to say that um, living in, it, with this this sort of um, ugly monster in, you know, there and trying to compartmentalize um, what who we are and what and what we're doing and and still find value in creating um, for the future um, has really slowed me down. I feel like it's really um, dialed back my um, my rhythm and um, how I think and how I'm creating. Mm -hmm. uh, Jan, how about you? Uh, I, I know that um, in your, uh, uh, I mean, in, in your practice, so much of it is about, as you say, about your relationship with um, those, those special items that, that you find in, and, and recover. Um, has, has your relationship with those items changed over the past few months? Well, <laughs> luckily I save a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I stash it away. I pick it up and just stash it away. So that's kind of been a saving grace, I suppose. But um, of course, it's really quite difficult to go out there and do the hunter gathering right now. It's just, I've just sort of started. Dress so has just reopened. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. You know, I, I actually have started, but this started off. Uh, about five years ago, I used to look at certain pieces, like older pieces, and sometimes I would just take the pieces off and and I would burn them in my fire pit in the backyard, mm -hmm. you know, the old wood. But now I, I have stopped about five years ago doing that because, well, as we were talking about, wood is such a precious commodity and everything I look at is a precious commodity. So now I do something I call transformation where I will take a piece, I will take all the old pieces off of it because it just didn't work for me anymore, whatever. And I started paint, I started painting them black and, and have covered the surfaces with these tiny little buttons mm. and then repainted it black. And to me, it's almost like it is invocative of so many things, you know, the number of Africans that were shipped to the new world. I mean, it, it's, and just the surface is like a very foreign kind of moonscapey kind of reptile skin sort of surface. And then I rebuild the story with whatever I can find, even some of the discarded pieces. And so, yes, I've actually started working on pieces that I consider transformation pieces. Mm. And I'm finding that it takes me into a whole new depth of my work and yeah, and also, you know, helps to save the planet, I suppose, because I'm <laughs> parting things. Yes. I'm reusing things, so. Um, now, I, I, one more, I, I wanted to ask you one more, you guys, one more question, but, and then I think we've got a couple coming in from the audience as well, which is great. Um, uh, I noticed in the conversation just now, you were all talking a little bit, I think, about themes of invitation. You know, I think, uh, Helma, you, you actually brought up this theme of invitation. You are, you're, you're inviting the audience to consider the nature of a digital image. And then, of course, um, uh, Heidi, you had, you'd mentioned the, the negative space as an invitation to consider uh, different histories through the, the modernist lens. And Sonia, of course, your piece is quite literally an invitation to, to consider Indigenous history. And, and Jan is an invitation, to, likewise, to consider the histories of, of African-American 
uh, African Africans Americans and and particularly uh, the slaves who were imported to to the United States. Um, do you think that uh, uh, art, that invitation is is uh, an essential element of art making? Do you think that there's a kind of dialogical element that that that, that you try to retain and keep in mind in, in your respective practices? Hmm. Okay, I think that that is very much uh, at the heart of much contemporary art, that people, that artists create evocative objects, objects that tend to ask questions about the way things are, or the way things are usually experienced. And you see that also indeed in how I work with photography, I ask questions about how we look, how we perceive, how we make sense of things. And I think in, in some ways that, that good art creates that, that opening, indeed what, he, what Heidi was saying about art being a portal into something, it makes space for a dialogue, it makes space for a discussion or a reconsideration of something. I think in our, our contemporary culture, we're so kind of inundated with images that kind of affirm or reaffirm states of affairs as, as we continually see them. And I think the big opportunity for contemporary art practice is to create objects and experiences that are invitations to, to question, to experience, and, and usually like discover something that is different from, that is some sort of a disturbance or interruption or reconfiguration of, of the usual. And I think mm -hmm. that's why people come to art spaces also to seek out those types of encounters and those types of experiences. Um, can I, Helma, I'm really glad you, you used the word uh, disturbance because that's what I was going to say mm -hmm. is that I think mm -hmm. that um, my work and I think all of our works are, uh, have this, this um, invitation to um, destabilize mm -hmm. uh, from you know, the person's uh, point of view being shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and, and I can't help but comment on Jan's work because by its very nature as a ceramic artist, it's being a vessel, there's an invitation for something to come into the vessel. And I love the way you flipped it and, and you know, put everything on the outside of the vessel, but there's still an inherent and kind of implicit invitation to, to um, fill the vessel in, in it. Yeah, I think, I think all my work is a questioning. And, you know, going back to this whole idea of, well, you know, since even I was a child, when I was a child and we would go to our uh, um, auditorium, we were still singing God Save the Queen and saluting the Union Jack, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's my ongoing questioning and inviting people to question the status quo, question what we've been taught, question what what is kind of static in our, our hearts and our minds about ourselves because everything changes. Change is the only certainty in life, really. So um, yeah, it invites people to question themselves. Can I just say, I also really relate to what you, you, uh, you told, you, you've shared with us um, this afternoon, Jan, because uh, I, I grew up in the Maritimes in, in Fredericton, mm -hmm. New Brunswick uh, in, in the 70s and the oh, 80s <laughs> and um, yeah you know um, largest English speaking high school in the in the commonwealth um, mm -hmm. they bus people in for hours it was crazy. Common. yeah mm -hmm. in the commonwealth that's how it was and um, I graduated in a class of over 800 people and you could count on one hand the number of brown faces and so mm -hmm. um, and certainly the god save the queen and certain and so I think you know our experiences I mean there's just a um, Imp, you know, uh, implicit autobiography in, in the work that we do. I made, it, literally, I made a crucifix piece that's called Home and Native Land, and it comes from those assemblies where we would, I'd be singing my heart out, you know, uh, God save the Queen, our home and native land. And of course, as a child, with your child's innocence, I'm thinking we're honoring the indigenous people. <laughs> but no, could not be farther yeah. from the truth. Right. Oh, you know, it's it's a kind of like interesting thing. I think of all those changes that I've kind of gone through in terms of the knowledge you are presented with in the beginning and where you are now, so far much farther down the road. Mm -hmm. Now, 
we are actually already approaching the end of our hour here. The time has absolutely flown by, but we do have a couple of <laughs> questions here, which I think tie into what you're talking about, uh, Jan. Um, I have a question here for Sunny from uh, Sadwinda Baines. Thank you, Sadwinda. Uh, can, can Sunny speak to the need for more interactions between indigenous peoples and people of color who are also settlers? Immigrants who come from the east to Canada, for example, uh, there is such a huge void in this area of interaction. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think there's a lot of shared histories with a lot of um, people of color, black and indigenous peoples, um, you know, whether, you know, we were kind of uh, colonized, uh, brought over, um, immigrated, uh, there's this definite need for these, for people to come together and talk about our shared histories and our shared traumas to find the best way forward um, to help people um, understand what we are talking about now. Um, you know, I think when we take a look at this dumpster fire that 2020 has been, um, you know, COVID aside, we take a look at all the instances of hate that has come up uh, south of the border, which has um, influenced uh, hate here in Canada. And it really goes to, um, goes against what the ideal of a Canadian is, uh, being a tolerant, just, welcoming society and people. Um, but when we see people step up, for example, in uh, in uh, Nova Scotia recently in Micmac territory with the non-native fishermen burning down um, yes. a lobster uh, pounds, destroying boats, destroying lobster traps, uh, destroying the ways of life of Micmac fishermen who are out there trying to provide, to live a moderate life, uh, livelihood, a moderate fishery. Um, it's just really heartbreaking and I think that as people of color uh, you know we could really step up and support one another through um, these issues um, and work our way forward to help build a better society that is truly welcoming just and tolerant um, but we have a shit ton of work to do and I think that's <laughs> that's where this all starts to happen and this is where people start coming together and we kind of we kind of see this right now um you know there's there's a lot of um you know youth that i follow on instagram you know youth like under 30 um that are put in their body bipoc people put in their bodies on the line um for um racial injustice in the united states which speaks to racial injustice which is going on here um, people are putting their bodies on the line for Wet'suwet'en land rights and various other Indigenous rights. Um, people starting to speak up about the lack of uh, water infrastructure in Canada for uh, Indigenous communities. We have a community in Ontario that's under a 25-year boil watery and do not con boil water and do not consume advisory. Portable. This, it's they're lacking potable water. They have to. They leave. They have. They've had to leave their community. They were forced into this reserve situation, and now they're being forced out of it to get to have access to clean water. Um, and this is where I think a lot of um, these uh, conversations, you know, that you know, he the the person who's asking the question was speaking of. You know, we can all come together to challenge and 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 fight this and bring awareness to it. And I think that's probably the. Thank you, Sonny. Very well spoken. <laughs> um, we are, I think we've got time for just one more question. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for all of them. Uh, I am going to grab this one here. Uh, this is for Jan. Uh, yeah. Jan, can you please tell us more about your memory jug? And a comment here, I think interesting comment. It's interesting, Jan, that you say that your work invites people to question themselves because in order to change society, we have to start and work on ourselves first. And this is from uh, Mandy Brook. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Well, absolutely. Um, you can only really start with yourself. You know, I'm not the great judge and jury of what other people do, but I can only really start with myself and, you know, try to express my own change, which I think is a change that is happening, starting to happen within the larger society. Um, 
my memory jug come, comes from an idea I had when my grandmother died and I finally went to her grave. And um, I, I, I kind of grew up with a real black Southern aesthetic musically um, through visual art, et cetera. But now I've really started to express that memory jugs um, at a time when slaves had died, usually what would happen is they would take the person's belongings and place them on the grave. And, and um, that was to honor their spirit. But then they started taking like jugs and vases and they started actually adhering um, objects of the dead person onto with mud or paint, whatever they had, onto these vessels. And I always loved the idea of the vessel because honestly, the vessel I used, it almost has the gravatus of a body. So um, just, I suppose, my memory jug is a more societal mourning object. So, but with the, with the Black Southern aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So that was my first memory jug um, piece. And I have actually started working on other, but that's basically how it started during the Day of the Dead Festival on Grand Island. So mm -hmm. that was how I originally had made that piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jen. And, and I believe you, you I've heard um, that you're now going to be having a show at the Vancouver Art Gallery coming up soon. So you'll be showing this more. This is the those. rumor. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, uh, very excited first, to see more. The of first you. Black female Vancouver artist with a solo show at the VAG. It's 2020. Yeah. It's you know, so hopefully I hold the door open for all the other kids behind me. <laughs> that's insane uh, to think about that's the first, <laughs> but congratulations because that's a major, uh, major accomplishment, especially yeah. with, you know, the, the rich and unique his black history that, that, that is present in Vancouver that is Vancouver, tremendously yes. unknown about. <laughs> that's right, that's tremendously. Huge. Yeah. Well, they've got the, you know, Hogan's Alley Society. Now that kids have lifted up the batons and the banners and they're running with it. So good. it's really good. I hope we get somehow, I hope the Hogan's Alley Society gets a community center out of this. <laughs> Somewhere okay. to the road. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, everyone, I, there is so much more to talk about. And I, I am totally shocked by how quickly the past hour has flown by. But unfortunately, I think we do have to wrap it up here. So um, I just want to take this time to thank all of you for joining us today for the wonderful conversation. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us from home. Uh, I, 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 this is a, well, among the first time the Surreal Gallery has done an event like this. So we're excited to continue to bring more content like this to you. Uh, just a reminder, this is a part of our Art Together series, which is our online programming stream. You can go to our uh, website, you can go to our YouTube page to see many other items we've uploaded as a part of Art Together. And I'd like to remind you all that the Surreal Gallery is open. In addition to where we have been, we have several other exhibitions on display, including Passages, an exhibition of ceramics in the lobby of the Surrey Art Center. We have Carol Sawyer's Proscenium, wonderful video installation, and Searching for Surrey, an exhibition from the Community Living Society. So please do come to our website and book a tour with us. Uh, we are maintaining social distance protocols and uh, sanitation down here, so we'd be happy to, to see you come on by. And uh, with that, we do have a little credit sequence to thank everyone who participated in our production today. So please stick around and take a look at that. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining Bye, guys. us. Okay. Great talking with you. <laughs>